So uh, as another case study for regression, I want to talk about computer tomography. So that is uh, where you acquire multiple images, typically uh, with X-ray, and then try to reconstruct a 2D or 3D image or volume from those projections. There are two approaches to computer tomography. One is uh, based on back projection and related techniques. This is what I'm not talking about here. And the second one is called algebraic reconstruction technique. or ART for short. And uh, my impression is that uh, ART is slowly winning over back projection because it allows you to put in more prior knowledge or different constraints uh, which are not possible in back projection. Now, actually talking about terminology, algebraic reconstruction technique in itself <coughs> is the name for a particular algorithm to solve a system of linear equations. I'm not interested in this particular iterative algorithm here, which works well for sparse matrices, but I want to talk about uh, how this solving linear system of equations here arises in the first place and what it has to do with computer tomography. Now, it works as follows. Let's say this is the image that we want to reconstruct from projections. My image consists of pixels. And I'm now taking some ray. So uh, let's say this is an X-ray. And I have an X-ray source somewhere here. And I have a detector. So in typically people use uh, multiple rays and multiple sensors at the same time, but the argument works just the same for just a single ray and a single sensor. And the idea is that this ray now rotates around the sample or the sample rotates within the ray and we get lots of measurements out. And the unknowns are my intensities or uh, X-ray absorption capacity, the optical density, at those different pixels and I can now compute for each ray uh, to what extent it interacts with, e with each of the pixels. So this length here is the amount of interaction this ray has with this particular pixel. That is how much it interacts with this one. You get the idea? Whereas I have uh, zero interaction between this ray and a lot of other pixels. Now, this information I can collect in a matrix. So, I'm using here my design matrix X. Where I have on the one hand one row for each pixel of the reconstructed image. So those are the entities here, the pixels of my reconstructed image. And I have on the other hand uh, one column for each ray. So here I have the number of pixels, and here I have the number of different rays. And now for, for each particular ray, like uh, this single ray here, I can uh, indicate in this matrix to what extent it interacted with all pixels. So for example, I could start here and say I had zero interaction with this pixel and zero interaction with the next pixel, zero interaction with the next pixel. And then here, you know, let's say this length here was, I'm making up this number, 0 0.8. And then uh, if my image was already finished here, you know, then I have zero for this pixel and a zero for this pixel. And then I would have a 
let this be a 0 0.6, and so on. You get the idea. Okay. So how much the ray intersects with each pixel, I can uh, compute and put into this design matrix X. And as always, I'm multiplying this with uh, some vector beta transpose, which is actually the image that I want to solve for. And my observations are one by number of rays. Uh, this is the measured brightness or measured intensity for each ray. Okay, so this is the measured intensity. This is, so this is given. Uh, this thing here, the design matrix, is also given, or I can compute it. How do I do it? It's because I have control over my physical apparatus. So I can decide how the, relay, how the ray is related to the probe in terms of translation and rotation. And it's up to me to decide how much I, uh, let's say, rotate the ray around my probe uh, from one time to the next, and so on. So I can compute this. And these coefficients here, this is what's wanted. So uh, this is a vector, but I can, uh, by de-vectorizing, I can turn it into an image. This is the image that I'm interested in. So I have a picture here. Here, for example, you, you see, uh, let's say, this is the subject, and I've here indicated uh, a ray, and so actually the rotation has not quite matched this projection, but never mind. Um, so I can integrate along this ray, the optical density, and I obtain some kind of measurement, some absorb absorbance, let's say. And now I can position the rays any way I like. Typically, uh, people use multiple sensors at the same time, such that I use parallel rays, and then I rotate. In technical devices, it's typically the object. In patients, it's typically not the patient that's being rotated, but the gantry that you know, rotates around, around the person. Um, <coughs> and then we get out these measurements. So uh, in this case here, uh, I... I arbitrarily decided uh, to uh, have 70 sensors and to take measurements at 50 different angles and uh, this gives you something which is called a sinogram. Now if I vectorize this thing here it would become my vector y because I have one absorbance uh, that is associated with each particular ray and that's 70 of these rays happen to be here in parallel. Um, this is just a random design decision. Now, here's a, a look at the design matrix. Uh, the design matrix has nothing to do with uh, the fact whether I have a head here or something else in my scanner. Design matrix just talks about the geometry of my rays relative to the pixels of the image that I want to reconstruct. And importantly, this matrix is very sparse. So, you know, if I have a ray, it does not intersect most of the pixels in my image. This is why in my design matrix here, for each ray, I get very many zeros. And this is why this iterative algorithm called algebraic reconstruction technique becomes efficient, because it needs the sparsity in this matrix. Okay, now um, here is a result that I get by solving the system of equations. Uh, so the result in the top left, and it does not look in any way similar to the head that I expected. 
and uh, so I, I see some you know pretty random pattern here and I have some very very if I look at these regression coefficients so these are my regression coefficients now map back to an image and you see these regression coefficients become very large so I have 10 to the power of 8 uh, as a multiplier there now why is it so bad do I have a bug no I never have bugs uh, so can you think what went wrong if we get back to this picture please so this was measured this I computed from the geometry of my apparatus and I solved for beta using the least squares formalism uh, of course, my measurements here were a little noisy. Can you imagine what went wrong? Excuse me? What is meant by parameter zero? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, oh, 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 okay. Um, this is relative to what I'm going to talk to you about next, but I haven't done that yet. Yeah, please, you know, talk to each other and, and make any useful suggestion. Equations for, you know, planes, and we're looking for the intersection. And because there is, so if there is non-zero noise, then we don't have a clean intersection, but we somehow look for a compromise. And um, on the computer, I have a 3D sketch of, uh, you know, the same same idea here. So these are the individual so this would be one measurement two measurements three measurements and their intersection defines and uh, you know hopefully when you have three unknowns typically you would want many more measurements we want an overdetermined system um, can you exp well and, and somewhere at the intersection this is our solution this finds our parameter estimate can you argue in terms of this picture here, what would be good measurements and what would be bad measurements? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we we want uh, three or preferably more measurements. Yeah? But but so given that, what is you know what would be good measurement? What would be, what would be bad measurement? If we have noise in our system and if we want to determine the intersection point, I've almost given the answer. No. No, um, it's a convex problem, least squares. So um, we we have just a single minimum. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, that was a good point. The very similar observation. So, how would I translate very similar ob observations to this picture here? Sorry. Um, Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, good measurements are orthogonal to each other yeah, because they constrain the solution pretty well, whereas I, I'm not so good at drawing in 3D, so I'm doing it in 2D. Yeah. So uh, you see, let's say we have one measurement with some uncertainty and we have another measurement with some uncertainty, then I still know that you know my point is likely going to be here. But if we have some measurement and I should have indicated the uncertainty by shifting it a little bit. And if I have another measurement, which is at a very, uh, you know, small angle to the first one, if I now, you know, if I look at the intersection point between these two planes and they're both allowed to move a little bit, my intersection point moves a lot. Whereas if the me measurements are orthogonal, if my two measurements move, their intersection point does not change very much. Was it too easy? <laughs> or <laughs> perhaps you're just used more used to seeing things in formula and uh, not in pictures. Okay, so this is good and this is bad. And good and bad I can uh, you know make more quantitative by saying that uh, let's say if we have Gaussian noise then uh, I have a Gaussian profile as to where precisely uh, this plane would be located and I have a Gaussian profile as to where precisely the other plane would be located and then taking these two together will give me here a fairly compact isotropic Gaussian. Whereas in a case like this uh, I am obtaining you know, a, a very poorly localized Gaussian. So uh, it's well localized in one dimension, but poorly localized in the other dimension. Okay, if I'm again taking here this uh, product. Okay, so... Um, this is a motivation to... try and artificially decrease the correlation between uh, some of the measurements if we cannot get better measurements in the, in the first place. And, but this amounts to a perturbation of my, of my system and I want to argue why such a perturbation can be beneficial.